Hello everyone, it's Jeff. Gabriel Avalon asked me if I would do a quick video and show you guys how beautiful it is in the valley where the Great Salt Lake is and the mountains surrounding it. And so, here I am. This is the concert venue, um, the Great Salt Air. It is right on the lake. My sister actually saw Yanni here once. This is the story of the Great Salt Air. There are three incarnations of this great building and the story dates back to 1893. So let's start at the beginning. Completed and opened in 1893, built on wooden stilts extending far out into the lake allowing people to swim, the original Salt Air was a sight to behold. Being a mile offshore, it also had its own railway to take visitors out to the attraction. It was owned by a corporation which is a combination of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints and the Salt Lake and Los Angeles Railway, which was later renamed to the Salt Lake, Garfield and Western Railway. It was constructed for the express purpose of serving the resort. At that time, Salt Lake City was the second largest city west of the Mississippi. Salt Air was not the first resort built on the shores of the Great Salt Lake, but it was the most successful ever built. It was designed by the well-known Utah architect Richard K.A. Kletting, who went on to design the Utah State Capitol. From day one, Saltaire was massively popular. In the first year of its opening, it attracted 100,000 visitors. In fact, by 1919, it was regularly gathering over 440,000 visitors a year. Even the Wright brothers dropped by one year with their heavier-than-air flying machine, that's how popular the place was. Salt Air was a family place. It was intended to provide a safe and wholesome atmosphere with the open supervision of church leaders. While some of the other resorts in the area were seen as spiritually bleak, a young courting Mormon couple could visit the Salt Air without worrying about gossip. Trains left from Salt Lake City every 45 minutes, and so long as the boy got the girl home at a reasonable time after the train arrived, parents weren't worried. In part, because from the moment of arriving at the station before the outing until they left the station coming home, they were usually never out of sight of trusted members of the community. More than once, a couple on the way home found themselves in the same car as their parents, who themselves had been dancing at Saltaire. Saltaire really truly was a wonderful piece of architecture. Its main attraction was the saltwater lake in which people swam, although back then it was called bathing. The other main attraction here was music and dancing. And when originally built, that was it. You came out here to listen to music, to dance, to hang around, or go swimming. The main feature of the lake here was it is never deeper than four feet, making it a perfect huge swimming pool. Added to which, the salt content of the water making it impossible to sink. The main island complex was flanked by two large wings, seen here to the left and right of the main pavilion. These wings contained over a thousand changing rooms, each with its own shower. Salt Air was a huge smash down in California, so much so that thousands of Californians came every year, and actors and actresses from the fledgling film industry flocked here to be seen. The heartthrob Rudolph Valentino was a constant visitor believing in the properties of the water to tighten the skin and help him stay looking young and beautiful. In later years, Teddy Roosevelt was a constant visitor, parking his car in the car park and stopped and staying for days. Another notable feature was Saltaire possessed the largest dance floor in the world. It was so large, two bands could play at each end of the hall at the same time to the same audience. They even had their own in-house band. This being in the days before big bands were on the scene. With the popularity of the place growing year on year, it was decided fairly early on that an expansion was needed. So they built this, the Hippodrome. Very quickly, the Hippodrome became even more popular than the main Saltaire attraction. It can be seen here to the right of the main structure, nestling behind the other new feature built, the Ship Restaurant. This was supposed to look like a ship at sea. A major region for the popularity of the Hippodrome was its indoor cycling track. They held races here regularly, 
with thousands of people in attendance, and when they weren't racing, you could hire a bike and race against your friends. Another attraction here was the opera. They actually had their own opera company based in the Hippodrome. Another popular and regular event here was World Championship Boxing, but sadly not at the same time as the opera, because that would have been fun. This was also right about the time fairground rides were starting to become popular. And as you can see here with the loop the loop they started small. This beauty is a looped carousel. This remained in place right up to the end and was very popular. This collection of matchsticks was a very early roller coaster. They didn't call them roller coasters, they called them scenic railways. And I'm pretty sure nobody will be surprised when I tell you this one fell down. We are now firmly in the 1920s, the Rip Roaring Twenties, and this was the Rip Roaring place to go. It was the place to be seen, it's where everybody wanted to be. However, on April the 15th, 1925, all that changed. The first of several fires to blight the place took place in a concession stand under the Hippodrome. The fire devastated the entire site. The dance pavilion was gone. The only two things to survive were the ferris wheel and the Big Dipper. But Saltair would rise from the ashes. Saltair 2 began construction in February 1926 and was completed by the following May, with its design heavily influenced by K.A. Kletting's original 1893 design, but cited to be bigger and better than the original. On opening day, so many people thronged to the place, the trains couldn't cope and were running late, with some people walking miles to get here. This was a strong start for the building, however, the result would see considerable changes over the following years. Saltair continued to be very popular during the 30s, with contemporary newspaper articles talking about people dancing the depression away. However, despite this, profits weren't being made and the place started to slip. By the late 20s, the lake had started to recede, and by 1935 record loads were recorded, which necessitated the owners building a transportation system just to get people to the lakeside waters. Round about now, cars were becoming very popular as well, so the owners had to put in a car park so people could drive to the site. However, this had an adverse effect on the train, meaning less fares and less usage. Some of the pier head had survived the fire, including the two wings that held the thousand dressing rooms. However, the dressing rooms have been removed because around about now the focus was on rides. Notably this one, the Giant Racer. This monster of a roller coaster, one of the biggest in the world at the time, was a double track with both cars being launched at once so they raced around the track. To this day a similar one operates on Blackpool Pleasure Beach. And here you can see the wonderful ferris wheel from earlier that survived the fire, still in operation. The railway to the site had been modernised, i.e. electrified by now, and they had several trains running frequent services to and from the pier head. This is called an open excursion car. It is a type which the site was well known for, with many of the trains being made of these. However, many preferred to ride in these rail cars, especially when it was raining. This is car 502 which remained on site until several years ago when it had to be removed for safety reasons. In the meantime it had been the backdrop for many wedding photographs. In the 50s they invested in these much more modern rail cars in an attempt to draw customers back onto the tracks. But just as the case was everywhere else in America, by the late 40s and 50s the car was king. So a large car park was built and people used to drive to the site. This obviously had an adverse effect on the trains which did continue to decline. We're in the 40s now and back then a national pastime was dancing to big band music. Sauter attracted all the big names of the time. Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, even Frank Sinatra played here. People would come for miles to dance on what was the world's largest dance floor. In the 1950s, the combination of the demise of the big band and the fickle nature of the lake waters only served to speed up the decline of the site. Throughout the 50s it went downhill with very little investment and more and more people just not coming. Also, a lack of maintenance in this desert, salty environment, the only way is decay. Even the roller coaster didn't escape. Due to maintenance issues it was closed and then a windstorm blew up and the whole thing was blown over. That was the end of that. 
The final nail in the coffin was the receding water of the lake. With no water, there was no swimming, and swimming was the only thing left to do at Saltaire at that point. So people just stopped coming. The final year of operation was 1958. After that, it was closed for good. By the early 60s, decay had really set in, and the place looked skeletal, almost haunted and spooky. And it is for that very reason, Saltaire had one final fling. In 1962, inspired by the look of the place, Carnival of Souls, a classic early zombie movie, was filmed here. It's fascinating because they actually filmed the site as it was, and the character can be seen walking through the disused, abandoned site. At one point, she enters the funhouse. Imagine this crowded with kids screaming and laughing. Now, it's just deserted. Oh look, a masterclass in ham acting. Here we are under the pier. Take a close note of the wooden pilings. You'll see more of them later. The end finally came in November 1970. Arsonists set a fire in the middle of what had been the world's largest dance floor. The resulting conflagration destroyed everything on site, leaving nothing behind. The fire started late in the afternoon, and it soon took hold. It continued to burn throughout the night, destroying the building totally. Come the morning, Saltaire 2 had completely gone. Nothing left, wiped out. So what would you see if you went there today? Remember those pilings in the horror movie? Here they are. This aerial photograph is of the giant racer, once one of the largest roller coasters in the world and a great hope for this place. Here you can see the stone footings for each of the wooden uprights that the trestles once stood on. Because the coaster never burnt down, but just fell down in the wind, it lay there out in the bay. However, in the flood of 1983, the wood was all deposited on the beach, a mile and a half from where it was once stood. And that, my friends, is where our story could, or possibly should, have finished. However, didn't we leave Jeff stood outside of a saltaire? In 1981, a third incarnation of Saltaire was built a mile west of the original site using, of all things, a salvaged US Air Force aircraft hangar. Once again, the lake caused a problem, only this time it wasn't the water disappearing, it was the 1983 flood which forced its closure. It was used as a venue for bands and various other events during the 90s but unfortunately, bigger and better venues closer to population centres kind of forced it out. In 2005, several investors from the music industry pulled together to purchase the building and are now holding regular concerts there. Bands and singers and DJs such as George Clinton, Green Day, Marilyn Manson and others now regularly play there. And who knows, maybe Saltaire will survive through to see out its bicentenary. So that's the end of my video. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and click the like button to hear when we do more of these. In the meantime, we left Jeff stood outside Saltaire number three. So let's head back there now and hand you over to him so he can finish off the video with a few more views around the area. Over to you. Thanks, Jeff. I'll do kind of a quick panoramic view these are the mountains, snow-covered mountains, like back toward Wyoming. And this is the Great Salt Lake off in the distance. It's uh, probably a couple miles out to the water easily. It's uh, not a very deep lake. Here is the mountains toward the Nevada side. This is Carrington Island. This is toward Wyoming. Here is the mountains toward the Nevada side. I will leave everyone with a view of the salt flats 
and the Wasatch Mountains beyond. Stay safe, everyone. Goodbye for now.